Amen. Well, some of you are aware that uh, the NCAA football this year decided to have a playoff system. They were ranking the teams about midway through the year, and they came to the end of the season and had the top four teams play in two games. Those were played on January the 1st, two semifinal games. Out of that, Oregon won and Ohio State won, and the national championship is going to be played a week from tomorrow, be January the 12th. So a lot of folks who care about those kind of things are excited about this first year being a playoff system and that there'll be an official national champion that'll be crowned. Now imagine for a moment that the two teams who played, or the four teams who played, the two teams who won on January the 1st decided, the coaches went into the locker room after the game and said, hey guys, great win, we got one more game, but we're not going to practice and we'll just show up for the game and, and January the 12th, and we'll play the game. What would you think would happen? Well, on that day, there'd be mass confusion and absolute chaos in that game. Who am I blocking? What am I supposed to do? How do I read the schemes? Whatever. That's not what's supposed to happen when, when, when they get together and do their thing. What's supposed to happen on Sunday? When we come together in this room, what, what's supposed to happen in here? Well, we're supposed to sing and we're supposed to pray and hear testimony and we're going to read God's word. That's not what's supposed to happen in here on Sundays. There's a purpose for those things, but that's not why we're here. And I believe in many churches across our land today there is confusion about what's supposed to happen on Sunday when we come together. Now, the good news is that God has made it very, very clear to us what we're supposed to be doing when we come into this room on Sundays, when we gather together. If you will, open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, and it's a strange place that we would discover what's supposed to happen in here on Sunday. You'd think that you would go to a New Testament passage as it relates to the church and the practice of the church and its worship. But I want to show you this morning, really from God's eternal plan, what is supposed to happen when we come together in our time on Sunday mornings. Genesis chapter 2, I want to read the first three verses. Chapter 1 is God creating the heavens and the earth. He has created man. Now chapter 2, verse 1. So the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed. By the seventh day, God completed his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, for on it he rested from his work of creation. Now what in the world does that have to do with what we do on Sunday mornings? Right, I'm going to show you several things about the passage and uh, have some other texts that will help build the case for what we're supposed to be doing on Sunday because I believe this is part of what God wants to teach us during our time of fasting and praying. From a corporate perspective, from the body of Christ perspective, what are we going to be doing and what are we supposed to be doing? What should we have been doing all these years since God's people have been gathering together on Sunday? a Sunday morning like this, or whenever they gather in a time of worship. All right, first of all, I want you to notice that God is at work. Now, I, I, I made this point in particular when we looked at what's supposed to happen when we go to work. God's a, a God at work, and I want to just reemphasize that here in this one point this morning. God's work began with creation. And I want you to notice that God's creation, His work, was by God alone. Notice it says that it was His work. It was something that He had done. Now that includes the Godhead because we know that the Bible says that when He made man, He said, let us make man in our image, plural. The Godhead was involved in creation. That's, a, that's another message, another time and day to really explain all of that. But the Bible tells us that the Godhead was in, involved, but God was doing His work. That means that creation was not created by a human effort. It also means that nature did not create nature. 
God created nature. Now, there's a process that is involved with nature, uh, with the different kinds and how they evolve within that kind. But we find that God is the one who is created. God is the one that started the whole thing. God is God created, as the Bible says, and God is still working. Jesus said in John 5, 17, my father is still working and I am working also. That's important to understand with the fact that he rested on the seventh day that we'll come to in just a moment. But we find that God worked then in creation and God is still working and the Lord Jesus is working. Jesus said in John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. All right, so God is at work. God is still working. Henry Blackaby, many years ago, developed uh, some material called Experiencing God. And in that, he talked about seven realities that we experience when we are in a relationship with God. This is what really is supposed to happen in your walk with the Lord. First of all, he says in these seven realities, God is always at work around you. You may not see God working, you may not feel that God is at working is at work in your life, but God is always at work around you. Now, what work is He doing? Well, He's bringing about redemption. He is reconciling the world to Himself through Jesus Christ. Now listen, He has chosen you, His people, to be involved in that work. Every one of us or joining God in His work. That is the work that God is doing, is bringing the world to Himself through Christ. And the way that He's doing that is that He's chosen you and He's chosen me to be involved in that work. God, what's the big picture? I want to use you to bring that person to me through Jesus Christ. I want to use you to bring that person whoever that person is in your life, that God has brought into your life where you intersect with them. So God is at all work. He's always at work around us, and that's the work that God is doing. All right? Secondly, God pursues a continuing love relationship with you that is real and personal. It's not about the religious aspects of Christianity. It's about a relationship, a love relationship that we have with our Father, with our Savior. Third, God invites you to become involved with Him in His work. We often get that turned around. We're inviting God to join us in the work that we think He wants us to do. But God is at work around us, and when we discover what He's doing, He invites us to join Him in that work. Then God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, through prayer, through circumstances, and through the church to reveal Himself to reveal his ways, to reveal his purposes about what we ought to be doing as it relates to his work. Number five, God's invitation for you to work with him always leads you to a crisis of belief that requires faith and action. And listen, what you do next proves what you believe about God. God's at work. God's invited you to join him in that work. You're here. I want you to do this over here. That, comes, that means that you're confronted with a crisis of belief. Am I really willing to believe God in His Word and do what He says? And what you do next proves what you believe about God. God told you to do something. Jay gave a great illustration. God invited him to do this. This is where I'm working. This is what I want you to do. So he's had a crisis of belief. What is he going to do? What he did next proved what he believed about God. At first, he didn't have the faith to believe God at his word. This is what I want you to do. Later, he learned, this is what I need to do. All of us go through this cycle. When that happens, you must make major adjustments in your life to join God in what he is doing. In my experience, when God is at work and all of a sudden he invites me to join him in that work, it's no small step. It's a big step. It requires a big step of faith and a major adjustment in my life. Then finally, you come to know God by experiencing, by experience as you obey Him and He accomplishes His work through you. Now this is important because it builds the case on what, what we find in God's Word in Genesis. 
God is at work. God is always at work around you. I, I, I don't believe God is at work. You're going you're to see that he is. All right. So God is at work. Number two, from the text in Genesis, God completes his work. Chapter 2, verse 1, notice. So the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed. Chapter 2, verse 2. God completed his work. Very simple. God completed his creation. That means that God is going to complete the work that he's doing. As he's working around you, he's going to complete that work. God's going to complete the work in his church. Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Hell is not going to stop the work of God through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I'm building my church, and hell's not going to stop it. Sometimes we hear about churches, and they're failing, and we hear churches that close their doors. We hear churches that are unhealthy. The church is not going to be defeated. Little outpost of church might succumb to the enemy, but not the church that Jesus is building. It will never fail. It also means that God will complete his work in you. Paul said it like this. He who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. God's invited me to join him in this work. This is the work that I'm to do. I know that this is what he wants me to do. But it just doesn't seem it's, it's going to happen. I mean, when, when am I going to really feel that the work has been accomplished? God's going to complete his work. You need to be patient. You stay at it in what he's called you to do. In the battle that you're in, you stay faithful to it. You don't see any hope, but God said he's going to complete his work. Third, God creates something good when God works. Notice in days one through five, the Bible says, and God saw that it was good. Day six, Genesis 1, 31 at the end of day six, the Bible says, And God saw that all he had made, he looked at everything he had made now, and it was very good. So everything that God created was good. That means that God never creates anything bad. God never creates anything bad. Everything that God creates is good. Man in his sin has made something bad of it. Well, you just go down the line. We can go down the line. Things that, that, that we think are now so bad were perfect when God created it. But man has marred it. Man has changed it. Man has made an idol of that which God made, and it was good. So many examples in life that we experience And so we realize that whatever God is doing is good. And it means in this context that God was content in his work. And we need to come to that place where we need to be content with the work that God is doing in our life. God looked at his creation and said, it's good. I'm content with what I've created. And we need to say that I see the work that God has done. I'm not happy about it. Because it's not what I thought it was going to be. Jay said that. Jay said, you know, it wasn't going the way that I thought it was supposed to go. And so whenever we look at what God is doing in our lives, we are content with that work. Number four. Here's where I want to drop the anchor. God celebrated his work. Notice. He rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, for on it he rested from his work of creation. Now in this, Jesus, or I mean God gives us three aspects about the seventh day that we need to understand. Number one, and by the way, the seventh day can be synonymous with the Sabbath. All right? So whenever you see the word synony- uh, uh, synonymous, whenever you see the word seventh day, it's going to be synonymous with the word Sabbath, which we'll come to in just a moment. First of all, He says that he blessed the seventh day. That means this was God's Sabbath. This was God's Sabbath. Ten times in verses 2 and 3, you see the word God. God speaks of himself. God or he or his or him. Ten times it's about God. Everything happening. 
And so we find that on this seventh day, God rested. And this was a day that, that, that it was his day. It was his Sabbath day. Notice, secondly, he says about the seventh day that it is holy. This became Israel's Sabbath. The word holy means to be set apart, dedicated to God. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. What is found in Exodus chapter 20? Somebody tell me. Very good. The Ten Commandments, all right? Notice what he says, the fourth commandment. Verse 8, chapter 20. Remember to dedicate the Sabbath day. You are to labor six days and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You must not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the foreigner who is within your gates. For the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything in them in six days. Then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and declared it holy. All right, Israel was to keep this day, this seventh day, a holy day. They were not under the law. They were not supposed to work on this day. But it became a day that they distorted. It was a day that they ignored. It was a day that they declared basically unholy. They destroyed the day. And the, reason, the, the way that they did that was by adding all these rules to what you could not do on the Sabbath. They added burdens to men. Because of what they thought that meant. Going by the letter of the law, not the spirit of the law. Now in Deuteronomy, we find that the book of Deuteronomy is actually a speech that Moses gives. It's about a two-hour speech that Moses gives before Israel goes over into the promised land. They're right across uh, the Jordan River. Moses dies, but just before he dies, he gives this speech, and he's recapping the law. He's recapping all that's happened. And we find a second reading of the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 15. He quotes Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, but notice he adds something to it. He says, remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. That is why the Lord your God has commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Notice that last line. He says there's a second reason you're to keep the Sabbath day. He says you're to, you're to worship God not just as your creator but as your redeemer. You're to worship God as the one who has created everything. He's created you and you glorify him that he's the creator God. But he also delivered you from your bondage. He has redeemed you. You were in slavery you are in bondage. And so he's reminding them that when you come together and worship, when you remember this Sabbath day and you keep it holy, that you're coming together to worship the Creator God and the Redeemer God. But there's a third aspect to this seventh day that, that God gives us. He says that it is a day of rest. God rested on this seventh day. This is our Sabbath. We're not bound to the law. And, and how the law talked about the Sabbath day. But there is an aspect of it that we should remember. There are principles about the Sabbath day, the seventh day of the week that we keep. But we need to understand what this word rest means. God rested not because he was exhausted or tired from his creation. The word rest really means that he ceased from creating. Can you imagine God creating? He spoke it into creation. And that he got tired, that he was exhausted from that work, and so he, he took a break. He needed a nap. He needed to rest. He needed to sleep on the seventh day. No, it just means that he stopped creating. Now, Jesus was accused of breaking the Sabbath, which is the context of John chapter 5, verse 17, when I read earlier, when Jesus said, my father is still working and I'm working also, because they were saying, you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. That work that he was doing on the Sabbath put him on the cross. Where he finished, he completed God's work, his plan of redemption. So we see it coming full circle of what God was doing in creation and how Jesus finished that work of redemption 
that he was trying to communicate to Israel, it was finalized when Jesus went to the cross. Today we rest not because of a day. Our Sabbath rest is not because of a day. It's in a person, Jesus Christ. Now here's the main point that I want to make. What, what's supposed to happen on Sunday? What did God do? God created on six days. On the seventh day, he looked back at all of what he was doing. He looked at his work and he celebrated on that day. And that's exactly what we're supposed to do. When we come together on Sunday, we're supposed to look back over the previous six days at the work that God has done in our lives. And when we come here on Sunday, we celebrate on this Sabbath day, on this day of rest. It is a day of celebrating what God has done. Now, all these other things that we're doing are for that reason. Our prayers, our songs, the message, everything is pointing to God about the work that he has done in our lives and is doing in our lives. And we come together and we celebrate that work. Now, when you understand that, you come on Sunday morning with a totally different perspective about what's supposed to happen on Sunday. Nothing else matters. I come with anticipation. I come with a sense of joy. I come with a sense of excitement that I'm here to celebrate what God has been doing in my life. But is that really happening? When we come together on Sundays, what are we thinking? What are we talking about? What's our focus? What do we like? What do we not like? Rather than, no, no, I'm coming today because I'm here to celebrate what God has done in my life over the previous six days. We are focused on God, nothing else. And see, that affects the way that I worship. It means that I have freedom in my worship. There's passion in my worship because there's a sense of excitement knowing that God has been at work. Now, that should force us to ask several questions. Now, please hear me. Number one, here's a question you need to be asking in light of what I just said. Why am I not worshiping with an attitude of celebration I ask yourself did I come in this morning with an attitude that I was going to celebrate what God has been doing in my life if not why is that why am I not coming with an attitude of, of celebration of excitement secondly why am I not engaged in worship why is there no freedom in worship why is there no passion in worship third question what has God done in my life the last six days what has God done in my life the last six days that's a very important question if you're here this morning and you say right now you know I I, I really can't say that there's anything that he's done in my life the last six days all that means is you're not in his word. You're not praying. You're not sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're not serving somebody else. Because believe me, if you're in his word, if you're praying, if you're sharing the gospel, if you're serving, God's working in your life and you'll know it. Can I have an amen? amen. To say that God's not done anything in my life is only an indictment about what I believe is supposed to happen in my Christian life. And, and God at work in my life doesn't mean that I'm sitting back waiting on God to bless me and to answer my prayer. That's not what this is about. It's about engaging in a relationship with God. And when God is revealing himself to me about what he's doing, that I'm joining him in that work. Whether it's the work of prayer or it's the work of sharing the gospel, it's the work of serving somebody else. And I'm able to come on Sunday morning, and I'm able to look, and I think, man, God has been good. Yeah, I've been in the battle. Yes, there have been disappointments. Yes, there have been failures. I've sinned against God again. But God has forgiven me of that sin. You can at least come and say that. 
You can come and say, as much as I've sinned this week, God has saved me and delivered me from the bondage of my sin through the power of Jesus Christ. And as he was telling Israel, you need to come and worship me as as your Redeemer, that's what he's saying to you and to me. That's what's supposed to happen when we come together on Sunday. You see, what the problem is, is that when we come on Sunday, we're not prepared There's confusion. There's chaos. What does that football team do? Every day, every day, they're preparing. They're getting ready for the day. And we need to be looking back over the six days and preparing and getting ready for what's going to happen this coming Sunday. When I can come and I can celebrate. You see... If I'm celebrating what God has done in my life, and you're celebrating what God is doing in your life, it's going to change the whole dynamic of what's going on in here. It's going to totally change the dynamic of what we experience when we get our focus off all the other stuff that we think is important in our lives and what's going on here at church, rather than it's just God and who He is. And what he's done in my life. So much to say about this. But I tell you, I I just want to to be honest with you for just a moment. Can I? I'm burdened. I'm concerned. About what's supposed to happen on Sundays when we come together. And it's really not what's happening in here at the moment. It's what's been happening the previous six days. What's what's really going on in the lives of our people? Is there a real connection? I'm not making a blanket statement. I know that there are those who are in a real love relationship with God and God's at work in their lives. But it ought to reflect And what we do on Sunday when it's not reflective here. I'm not saying that we shout and dance and jump a pew and something like that. I'm just saying there ought to be an engaging experience when we worship the Lord. And we sense that. We we sense the Spirit. The freedom of the Spirit. And that plays in how we worship. It, it, It plays out in what happens during the invitation. When people are moved by God's Spirit. Whatever that means, as God reveals himself to them. Well, God celebrated his work. We should do the same. That, that's what's supposed to happen when we come. The last thing I want to say very quickly. Notice that God's Sabbath rest continues. Notice after each day, first six days, it said there was evening and then morning. But not on the seventh day. It doesn't say that. And the reason it doesn't say that is God's rest is perpetual. God's rest is open-ended. God's rest is eternal. It's something that continues. It's not a moment. It's not a day. It's not creation. It's not going into the promised land at Canaan. It's a rest that we experience through Jesus Christ. The rest that he said he would promise us for those who come to him. You're burdened? I'm going to take that burden away from you and I'm going to give you true rest. See, when he said that, it's all a part of what was going on with the idea of God's Sabbath rest. The writer of Hebrews makes that very, I don't have time, my time has ended. I don't have time to read the book of Hebrews, chapter 3 and chapter 4, where he speaks of the Sabbath rest. What was the writer of Hebrews say? If God had intended for Israel to experience their rest in Canaan, he would not have talked about today where he said, don't harden your hearts. Israel was not able to enter the promised land, the original group who left Egypt, because of their sin of unbelief. Joshua and Caleb were the only two out of all those who came out of Egypt. And he says for us, that the Sabbath rest continues for us who are in Christ. That's where we find that rest. So God wants you to rest in Him. 
but it's not a rest of inactivity. It's a rest of celebrating the Creator God, the Redeemer God, and what He is doing in our lives. And so I pray during these 21 days of fasting, beginning today, that you approach all this differently. You approach next Sunday morning in a whole different paradigm. I'm coming this next Sunday prepared to celebrate what God has been doing in my life these past six days. So I'm excited. I'm very excited about all of us who are going to be fasting and praying. We're going to be looking at what God is doing. We're going to be more aware of God's Spirit speaking to us and moving in our hearts. And we're going to say, you know, the pastor said that God's at work, and I sense God speaking to me. I, I see an opportunity to serve somebody. Here's an opportunity for me to share the gospel. I need to pray. I'm in God's Word. He's revealing Himself to me, and I can't wait to come Sunday and thank Him and praise Him and to celebrate what He's doing in my life. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment. There's somebody here today who would say, Pastor, I, I've been religious, but I'm really not in that kind of relationship that you're talking about. And I know that I need that in my life. I know about God, but I really don't know Him. I, I'm not experiencing God like you described. And this morning, I want to give you an opportunity to come and and enter into that relationship with God. Allow Him to give you the rest that He wants to give you. As you turn from your sin and turn to Christ as your Lord and Savior. No longer going your way, but now you're surrendering to His way. To His life. Where He will forgive you of your sin. Where He will walk with you. He will help you. He will give you the wisdom that you need. The strength, the love, the power. And to know that that rest that I enter is for all of eternity. Think of it this way. Think of a dot on a piece of paper in a line. Your dot, that dot represents the number of years you're here on earth. And that line represents eternity that has no period at the end of the line. We're here just for a short time. And we have all of eternity with Him. Yes, we'll experience that rest then. It culminates in the second coming of Christ. But it can begin today. Instead of trusting in your works, you're trusting in His work, His redemptive work on the cross. Father, I pray that you'll help these who need to make commitments today, these who need to give their hearts to Christ. Others, Lord, who... You've spoken to their hearts today, a place that, that needs to change, an attitude that needs to change, a perspective that needs to change. Lord, I pray that you'll continue to teach me really what's supposed to happen on Sunday as we come and celebrate you. God, I pray for these who need to become part of our church family as you lead them this morning. Others who may just need to come and pray, to talk with someone who can help them. Lord, have your way in our hearts now as we continue our worship in Jesus' name. Amen.